thank you so much for doing this. Oh, absolutely. Welcome. Love it. This is, in a lot of ways, a home away from home for you. Yeah, for 24 years. 24 years. Yeah. So when did you start? I started in 1999. It could have been 98, the end of 98, Mm -hmm. I believe, Mm -hmm. beginning of 99. Worked 24 long years, and you retired from here 2018 or 19? What was it? It was before COVID. When I left? Mm -hmm. 2020. Okay, was it? Yeah, I, yeah. That was a chaotic year. My retirement year. started kind of, December, January 1, 2020. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. I might not have been working 2019, but I was working. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I understand. <laughs> that was an odd year in a lot of ways. So, um, Walt Quinn, by the way, for those that I'm sure that won't happen, everybody knows you, Walt. Um, tell us about your first gig here at Cumberland Heights, 1999. What were you doing? What did you get hired to do? Yeah, I had just left uh, the music business after years of being in the music business. And um, I had, uh, my partner was in Los Angeles, Zach Flickman. And um, I had gotten, I'd, I'd had a pretty good run in the music business. And, and uh, but at the same time, it was starting to get pretty pressurized. And I mm. felt myself getting compromised a little too much and finally I went to uh, Zach and I said I think I think I need to change I don't know what I need to do but I'm going to go and so I just I just that was it and um, I happened to I'd never been to Cumberland Heights I'd lived here since 1985 but never been to it and um, a friend of mine was on the board of directors who was that John Denson okay and he was um I'd known him for a few years. And he said, you know what? They're looking for somebody to head up marketing. They're, the marketing fellow that was here, Joe, whose name escapes me, um, was not going to be here any longer. And uh, he thought it would be a perfect transition for me. And John Denson owned an ad agency in town. And I had used John on some ad stuff over the years right that's how i knew him so he was an advertising guy and um as a matter of fact he's the guy that created the new logo because we rebranded when i was here and uh so i brought in john and we we, just rebranded a little bit we didn't change your work though (laughs) i'll show you after this logo's still there yeah logo's still there (laughs) you can't i mean why would you it's it's a it's classic. There's no well, need to it was change. modernization. It's, yeah. at the time, and it was because uh, we it, had the um, the old style. It the, looked like Philadelphia, 1783. Yeah. What was it though? It was the was it the bell tower? It was the bell. Tower. It was the bell with the ch like in the middle of it. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. So all we did really was well, not all we did. We modernized yep. the bell tower basically yep. Yep. and gave it a new look and a modern yep. look. So, so that was the first um, thing you did. Well, that wasn't the first thing I did. This was like, that was down the line. But the first thing I did was uh, head of marketing, and probably at the beginning was director of marketing. I'm thinking, mm-hmm. and uh, so I was really do- at that point. My background was more marketing, advertising, promotion, publicity than business development. I'm not right. a sales guy. Right. I've just never been a sales guy. Right. But I was my background was to change, you know, whatever you're doing and try to do it better in a different way. So, uh, I started uh, work I put together a, a marketing plan and everything and started that working through that. And uh, I think the first year or so I realized that uh, we were local we weren't really national. Mm-hmm. We were more of a local mm-hmm. uh, organization, and um, but I felt like we had a plant that was, uh, you know, come beautiful. On, it's a beautiful mm-hmm. place. It's mm-hmm. big. It's mm-hmm. you know, it's in a beautiful area, mm-hmm. and I felt like that had to be something that would be good to get out there. Mm-hmm. And it used to be in a, in you go back into the eighties. It, and uh, uh, you get into the treatment centers that were back then, and people didn't really put their addresses out there. Mm. They just put phone numbers because they didn't really want – they thought people might not want to know what the address was. Interesting. Why? Because then they'd know – who went there? Oh, they went so in mm. Cincinnati. Well, that's treatment then. Mm. You know, I just right. – I think it was just kind of an unsaid. Right. So um, one of the things – I coming from the music industry – I felt like, you know, one of our biggest leads is the fact we're Music City, we're Nashville. And that, mm-hmm. to me, 
maybe we'll turn off some people. Maybe in New York they might not care that we're in Nashville, but other people will. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the beginning of thinking we should do some more national-type things. So we started going to uh, conferences nationally for the first time. Really? No kidding? Yeah. I don't think there was much of that. I think we went to one in Atlanta. That's about it. Um, Right. At the time, Walt, when you got started, when you think about marketing and you think about outreach or business development, how many, how many people were on the team? Well, <laughs> there was me, and then there was, uh, I think Frank Miller came in as head of development, business development. That was the two of that us, was really. Wow. And we had a, like two or three people working under business development. Right. I think that would be probably about it. Right, right. And um, so when we were going national, we're talking about changing everything, you know, everything from admissions and how they did their work and and how the how this place looked, you know, we had it really needed a big makeover Mm -hmm. to be to begin inviting people from all over. Of course, like for those that are familiar with our campus now, even, you know, Christina in the room, I always shout you out. Shout out, Christina. She's like a co-executive producer with Ryan on this show who would not survive without her. But um, obviously we didn't have the welcome center from a physical no. plant perspective. Mm-hmm. We didn't have this building. Mm-hmm. And I don't, at this time was the courtyard still a parking lot yes. or had that? Okay. Yeah, it was a parking lot. Yeah. And I think yeah. everything else, Hazel Hawkins was here. Which was Hazel Hawkins? I never the adolescent the building at that time. No, that wasn't That wasn't there. here either. Yeah. No. It was the gate was here. It was that an was, adolescent group. When I came, yeah, were, I think they were just shutting it down. Randy Lee had it, and it was in town. It was over by uh, what we call Club Two Hundred Two. Yeah, uh, over by Vanderbilt. It was over by Vanderbilt. And that's there was right because we had the school. Yeah, we had mm-hmm. a youth thing, and I think it was. I think some of them were um, um, court ordered. Yeah. I think it was a court order mm-hmm. thing. And no still anyway, waters. There and was we had, no still waters. We and been, that's a whole other story. And we had been doing um, a little bit of IOP since the nineteen early 1990s. Yeah. Just to... Just to the one on Thompson Lane. So um, I want to ask you in particular, because you guys, I know you did a lot of work, as you mentioned, with the rebrand, expanding our national reach and mm-hmm. our relationships, which mm-hmm. sort of like... To be clear, it's really beneficial to have relationships with peer organizations. Sure, from a referral perspective, referral network perspective, sometimes folks that are calling us aren't appropriate for our care for a myriad of reasons, and so we want to get them to the right place. That's, But also just having people that you can call about common problems yeah. is hugely important. Um to troubleshoot, ask them about tech, you know, what they're doing with advertising, what they're doing with technology, how they're hiring – all that kind of stuff yeah. was, sounds like y'all really did some of that pioneering work. Yeah, it was important to build in ourselves into a national industry because mm-hmm. really we didn't know that many people in mm-hmm. the national industry. Mm-hmm. Well, our industry was here. And so in building that, that's where the conferences became important mm-hmm. because that was the one place we were getting out and reaching out to people that mm-hmm. we didn't know that were very big in the industry. Mm-hmm. And... <laughs> uh, one of the first things I did from a music standpoint uh, was I began doing small in the round concerts at conferences all over the country. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so we'd go into. I started it with one set of of conferences is where it began, and we were in like either Boulder or Palm Springs or Scottsdale, different places, and I would take three solid. Uh, singer-songwriters that were in recovery, usually in recovery, uh, and do in the rounds, what we call in Nashville the, the musical in the rounds. So you'd have three songwriters who are entertaining anyway, but they're talking about where songs, these songs where hits came from and why they did them, and then they perform them. It's an entertainment, big entertainment in Nashville. So I started doing them at concerts all over, and it, that's one of those things. Cumberland Heights, music. Cumberland Heights, music. Hmm. So one of the main lead items about Cumberland Heights has always been music. Hmm. Surprisingly, it seems like a dichotomy from what we do for a living, Mm -hmm. but yet we're treating all these these musicians and artists and 
crew people and label people mm-hmm. through the years. So if we do one thing, especially in a strong way, it's worked with, with music people. Absolutely. In our longtime relationship with Music Cares. Yeah, Music Cares. We w- actually, we began working with a MAP, what was called MAP. Uh, musician's Assistance Program, which was a guy that um, was out of L.A. This is before Music Cares. And he was going around to different labels and getting money from them. To pay for treatment. Yeah, to pay for treatment. No kidding. So he'd go to Atlantic or he'd go to Warner Brothers and he'd get it. And he was an old jazz. He was an old Brooklyn Jewish jazz musician. Okay. And he was just funny, hilarious. But he could get this money from these guys, and he began working with all these different artists back then, especially a lot of rock out of L.A. And so I invited him out here, and he came out here with his wife and this other guy, Bob, who was uh, one of the main guys. And we started working with MAP, and they started sending some patients out. And about two years later, three years later maybe, um, he passed away, and his wife passed away. And Music Cares had been around for about a year maybe and they kind of took in the map. Map is still part of Music Cares. It's the hipper version of Music Cares. So they do a concert out there in L.A., and it might be the Chili Peppers, and mm-hmm. it might be just a more edgier groups than what the Music Cares would most mm-hmm. possibly do. Mm-hmm. But um, so we've worked with Music Cares since the beginning. Mm-hmm. I remember going to, mm-hmm. uh, on Music Row, Michael Green, who was head of Neris back then, came out to introduce Music Cares, and Debbie Carroll came out. She wasn't mm-hmm. part of it then. She was just coming in to see what was happening. And and uh, so we've been very beginning. And so mm-hmm. consequently, we've been the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest treatment center for Music Cares. More people from Music Cares come to Cumberland Heights than mm-hmm. anywhere else. Mm-hmm. And it's something we're proud of, you know. I think it, you're, you're kind of calling out something that is unique about Cumberland, but we don't take notice of very often here when you're yeah. here because it's just a part of our DNA. And we'll yeah. talk about the concert series that you started, but uh, or your team started. But you're right; it's a big part of. It's always it's a been big a big part, part of Cumberland Heights, and that's not it. I mean, we started the music program here, yeah, which we didn't have that before, and we said, you know what, we need to make it a clinical an actual clinical piece of Cumberland Heights. Right. And so that's when we went into creating the music program. Right. And that, that what's it, interesting that's for everybody, by the way. Every no, patient sure. Every right, patient right. that, not just musicians. What's interesting about that for like the clinicians that might or might not be listening is it, it, the music program wasn't necessarily started as a clinical tool. It was started as a medium to help people who were musicians. Yeah. And, and thus – the integration of music therapy themes and principles come with that, yeah. right? We Whereas, had, yeah, Cindy had mm-hmm. developed mm-hmm. Um, the clinical right. base for that, right? Which had to be done, and then we hired out of that, right? And, uh, and of course, today we got Johnny Mack who leads that. Yeah, up. Johnny mm-hmm. was perfect because what we were looking for, the first person we hired was a great music therapist, but not necessarily could keep. Mm-hmm. A group captivated for mm-hmm. sixty minutes. Yeah, we needed entertainers that were music therapists, right? And that's right. you know basically that's what Johnny, right. John has really done. One thing I'm proud about our our music program or really music offerings the depth is that Johnny Mac will meet everybody where they're at. Mm-hmm. So you can participate in the groups and you can show up and then you can leave. But you can also and you don't have to be a musician. You can spend a lot of time with him. Yeah, writing songs. They put on many performances all the time. Oh, we yeah. have musicians that are coming to campus, volunteering their time all the time. It is so it's very great unique. for the patients here. Yeah. Because it gets rally behind these guys. You get the patients that do a little concert thing out yeah. there. Mm-hmm. And, man, they are so hyped up mm-hmm. because they know these guys. They're right. in f- treatment with them, and then mm-hmm. they're out there, and, whoa, this guy does this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't even believe he's that good. He's unbelievable. He's mm-hmm. a star, you know, that kind of thing. So um, did the – let's talk about the concert series at the Ryman. Mm-hmm. So was the genesis of that uh, – did that come from your idea of taking singer-songwriters on the road to conferences? Or was no, that it actually was before that. Okay. And when I came here, I think the first one was in 1996, and we didn't directly start that. That was a – that was kind of a gift from the CMAs, the Country Music Association. It was during the big Garth Brooks period when he was really blowing up, and 
all these advertisers, may, like Wrangler and whoever, Budweiser, all these people, they wanted to secure for promotions and stuff in country. So they'd invite all these people in uh, from these different big corporations. and they, Advertisers, Yeah, they'd do a dog and pony for like a couple of days for them. They'd take them, you know, put them in the Opry Mills or whatever that's called, Opryland Hotel. And then they'd take them down, and they and one of the things they did was at one of the peaks was the Saturday night they did a Ronman concert, and the first one was with Laurie Morgan, and we didn't get a block. This was not the way we ended up doing it. It was kind of the germ of how it began, and they gave us a gift out of it. Got but, it. <clears throat> and then I came here, and. Um, I had, uh, I don't know, I can't remember how this happened, but I knew the Ryman guys, and one of the Ryman's women, the head of the Ryman back then, came to me, Pam, and said, Walt, she said, that seemed to be a pretty good thing you had going, you know, and do you want to keep doing that concert? And um, I said, what will entail? And she said, well, you guys will do it. We're not going to do anything. You're going to put the thing together. You're going to do the advertising, the promotion. You're going to do the ticketing. You're going to do the, the, all the mechanics. You're going to do the backstage. You're going to do the artist and everything, what they call a uh, um, just a um, four-wall, four-wall concert, basically. That's a Cumberland Heights concert. It's not a Ryman concert, technically. And I said, okay. And they said, well, we trust you because I had been in that business. Mm-hmm. Before I even got in the music business, after my band, which was even way before that, uh, I worked for Ice Capades, which was an ice show. And it was a big deal back in the, you know, until the 70s, 80s or 90s, whenever it stopped. And we'd go from town to town, and we have Dorothy Hamill and these big stars. And then we have what? some circus-type stuff, art, sk- skating artists. And it was a big show. That? And we go to Bridgestone. And now we did, I do... Two markets at any given time. So I'd go to Calgary and Edmonton, and I'd put the show on, basically. I was a promotion director for Ice Capades. So I'd start by these, get a big promotion from Coca-Cola and then uh, do some little advertising setups and then go to the other city and do that. And then I'd go back to the other city and do the ticketing and do the show and then I'd get done with that, and then I'd go back to the other shit and complete that. Right. So I learned how to put on concerts. But I, it was, and interestingly enough, they got it. It's a Barnum and Bailey uh, education. Barnum and Bailey Circus started this whole thing of how to do, and in fact, the last head of marketing for the Nashville Predators came from Mar- Barnum and Bailey, because it's like the it's like the PhD of how to put on a concert. And it goes back to circuses at the turn of the century. You're blowing my mind right now, Walt. I had I no idea that you had this history. No, I, I well, yeah. <laughs> right. That's incredible. So, That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. So it was just, you know, having the music background, having that background. Having your PhD. You know, and my PhD circa, in circus. Capades, yeah, and you know, circus, yeah. And coming in and being in recovery and coming to work here. Yeah. It just kind of all came together. It's and a God the concert thing. was where it seemed to make sense. And I got together with Ken Levitan, mm-hmm. and Ken Levitan's one of the top music managers in Nashville, and John Hyatt, the artist John Hyatt, Hyatt who I'd known for a long time. And we said, you know, let's put it on. Let's, let's take this on, and we'll go ahead and do it. And that's what we did for a long time. And, and basically, we'd uh, you know, get the artist and, and put the concert together and bring in the money. We have something like $4.3 million have come through on that concert. It's incredible. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the only reason I'm sounding astounded is because I just heard that figure for the first time (laughs) about 20 minutes ago. And I went, really? Yeah. Because I thought it was maybe three, one or something. I said, no, but at any rate, it's been a real influential piece in the industry, in the music industry. Here is a, uh, you know, uh, not long time nonprofit, uh, and so I'm, you know, it's it's been a great thing for Cumberland Heights on a number of different reasons, and not just that we get money out of it, but we also we have something that we can take people in our industry to, and 
it's our best foot forward, basically. Mm-hmm. You're going to come that weekend, come to the concert, mm-hmm. come out to the Cumberland Heights. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's, a, it's a great way to have a week for the outsiders to mm-hmm. come in and see what the place is about, mm-hmm. you know. The other, and this is the last music piece I can think of, um, Still Waters. Mm. Still Waters was a uh, a guy that had made widgets oh, and made millions story. of dollars yep. in widgets. Mm-hmm. Had uh, started had taken his money and bought this kind of uh, compound in Lobelville, mm-hmm. in Lobelville, Tennessee, about an hour ten minutes from here. Uh, and uh, because he was in the middle of nowhere, and most of his uh, clientele were uh, Asian. He would bring him in and they'd stay at the place. I did not know that. Yeah. And so he would sell them widgets. And it worked until global marketing. Then all of a sudden they figured out they could make their own widgets. Right. <laughs> right. So in the process, he lost it over, you know, whatever reasoning, sure. uh, taxes or whatever. Anyway, a good friend of mine from the business uh, uh, was a manager and uh, Bert Stein. Bert's, I think, on the board here still. Mm-hmm. I put him on years ago. But um, I had gotten a call from Bert, and he said, Walt, he said, I'm, at the, I'm in LAX. And he said, I've, I, John Huey and a couple other guys, and I bought this, land, this property. And he said, I didn't even think about what we were going to do with it. And I'm sitting here with Vince Neal lead singer Motley Crue, because he managed them. And he's sitting in the airport, and he's t- calling me live. And he goes, is that right, Vince? He goes, yeah, yeah, I think it's a treatment center. So Vince had told him, I think this place is a perfect treatment center. So Bert comes to me, and he says, will you come out and look at it? Because I think I'm coming back, and we'll go out and look at it. I said, I, look, it's, that's crazy. <laughs> that's just crazy. I, you know... Just think, yeah. sleep on it, Bert, because it doesn't sound normal. Yeah, today. right, right. So anyway, in that's effect, not the normal way that a treatment center gets started. No, yeah, right. No, yeah, no. So about four weeks later, or whatever, I said, okay, we we're like, and we went out there, and it looked like it was, it was looked like Elvis's house, <laughs> and it had all the bad Elvis furniture in it, you know, from like nineteen sixty four, yeah. sixty eight mm-hmm. kind of furniture. Mm-hmm. And but we could see there was a you know there was it was a gem, mm-hmm. it might have been hidden, but it was a gem. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so we ended up saying, you know what, let's try and do something. So we sat on it for about a year, I think. I think Jim Moore, who was the director back mm-hmm. then, used it as a fish camp for a while and <laughs> had all his buddies stand mm-hmm. over there fishing. Mm-hmm. But um, anyway, we that's what became Stillwaters. Not enough people know that story. That still the gen, the true genesis of Stillwater yes. is some sort of God centered meld mind between Walt Quinn, Ben Stein, and Vince Neil. So yeah, the uh, Motley Crue treatment you by, center, yeah, literally. <laughs> yeah, and it has become um, one of the programs we're proudest of. I know, you know, truly. I mean, the mm-hmm. the men and women that go through those programs. Uh, just have in fact i'm an alumni you are it's a special community it's a special you place. know that yeah you know yeah. it's it's uh yeah so we it was a really great thing but anyway i wanted to mention that because it's oh, it a great its story music pieces to it let me ask you this when you think about all the concerts you were a part of which one might have been the most memorable uh, well i'll tell you what a couple of them uh one was um one was michael mcdonald Michael, when we, when we got Michael, yeah, and Ashford the Simpson opened, mm-hmm. um, Michael hadn't had any many hits in a little bit. Mm. And he said, I'll do it. And I said, great. And uh, so we signed him up. Well, he put out the album Motown just about when we were, right before we kind of inked it. Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden, it becomes the biggest album of the year. Mm-hmm. I mean, Motown was a massive album for Michael. Mm-hmm. So the whole energy of the place and the fact it was so packed and it was just, that was one of the pieces. And he was so good. I mean, Michael McDonald, you just, it's just unreal how great mm-hmm. the guy is. 
But he also, interestingly enough, Ashford and Simpson was really important for him. I don't know if you know who Ashford and Simpson, they were two of the best songwriters at Motown, and they were a husband and wife team. And uh, But uh, their recognition was mostly of being songwriters, but they were entertainers too, but didn't have much going with that. But at any rate, well, that's not true. They had a couple of really good R&B singles, but um, he asked me if they could open, and I said, yeah, sure, you can open. And he goes, well, I want to pay him, but I don't want you to pay him. I'll pay him. Hmm. And I said, well, you don't have to. He said, no, don't worry about it. I'll pay him. And then he said, um, when they come, I'm going to go ahead and get them a limousine because they need a limousine. Hmm. And I said, I get it. I've worked with acts like that. Mm-hmm. I manage acts like that. that mm-hmm. It's kind of part of their community. It's important to be mm-hmm. seen kind of like that. Mm-hmm. So anyway, he paid for it, and they were phenomenal. I mean, they were just flat-out phenomenal. So that concert in totality, and they, they were so appreciative. They were crying when they got off stage. Mm. It was just touching, yeah. you know, to see. Because they were kind of on the ebb. They were older, and, and yeah. you know, and I was trying to think of a gift to give them. And I used to give our... The artists that we played, I'd give them collectible books. I thought that was something that they would care about. They wouldn't care about flowers. They wouldn't care about whatever, Mm -hmm. but they'd care. And so I got them an original first edition of Nat King Cole's autobiography, which was way out of print. And they were just, they couldn't, they were floored that I would get Mm -hmm. it for them. Mm -hmm. But that was a really exciting. And then Boz Skaggs. Mm. Because I, I know Boz. We used to play with Boz. I'm from, my band was out of San Francisco in the 70s. So Boz was part of my sphere. And so to be able to come and, and uh, he was just phenomenal. He's just, I don't know if you've you ever seen Boz Skaggs play, but he's mm-hmm. incredible. Those, you know, they all are, have different things. Mm-hmm. Not many people know, and this is more of a new piece of information. One of the concerts, of which I can't remember which, I think it might have been Montgomery Gentry, which I don't even know if we have posters of. I think we do, um, somewhere. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it's not going to hey, if who, who was a supporting act, but a friend of mine who worked with Hyatt said, I've got a good friend who's a comedian, and he'd like, can he open? And I said, my guess, you're John. I don't, I'm not going to say no to you because you're right. a good friend of John, and we need to do it. And he said, okay, I'm thinking a comedian. Well, it's going to go real well. Right. The guy just n- knocked him dead. This is like about six years ago, seven years ago. Who was the comedian? Nate Bargatsky. Really? Did you know that? Nobody know, remembers it. Nate Bargatsky opened. Shout out to Nate. We need to have him on the show, have him come out of Cumberland <laughs> Heights. Yeah. Can you believe that? It's just. I had no, I had no yeah. idea. And it's great to see his success. You know, oh, it's being unbelievable. In He's a millionaire. <laughs> He's gone from, from opening up for nothing to 100 bucks. Or, I, mean, I might have given him $100 best. Remember that, Nate. We gave you one of your first opportunities. Yeah, no, exactly. No, we're not a part of that at all. He's <laughs> he's worked really hard. It's, it's been cool to see just um, just over the last few years. I, I had no idea that we had that shared connection with him. That's really cool. Yeah. I, it's, yeah. It's, you told me once that. Kid Rock, oh was yeah, that one of that our shows was, is that yeah, right? That was a wild show. That yeah. was uh, that was the Leonard Skinner show. That's right. We were uh, I was off I was stage right with John Hyatt sitting there, watch standing there watching the show, and um, all of a sudden I look over to the left. I said, I think that's Kid Rock, and I, you, you can't. I mean, he's like six foot five, and he's Kid Rock. I said, that's Kid Rock. And I said, kid, I don't know him from Adam. Yeah, There's yeah, There's no right. reason I should be. He was actually there with one of the Predators. Okay. And uh, and uh, he said, yeah, and he, and he saw John Hyatt. And he comes over to us. He gets on his knees. And he goes, Lord, I'm not worthy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> to John. And yeah. John's like, he's going like this. And yeah. it was just, it was a great, I think it was cool for Con- John to see that kind of sure. thing. Sure, yeah. I I just want to say thanks, you know, um, and, you know, you know this because we see each other every now and again, but Mm -hmm. the work that you did at Cumberland Heights really mattered. And the work that I and the rest of the team, just by way of marketing and outreach and Joey Darby, like, you are, you really uh, changed Cumberland Heights. You changed our DNA. You helped us raise our game professionally. 
Um, as you've alluded to in many different ways, I mean, think about it. Still Waters, you know, uh, becoming a nationally recognized organization that we weren't before, uh, creating the concert series that's raised over $4 million to help for patient assistance. Mm-hmm. Uh, in other words, to scholarship dollars for people to come into treatment. Mm-hmm. That, I mean, if you think about your tenure and your impact, well, you know, one of the more impactful employees we've ever had. So thank well, you. Thank and you. I'm not thank worthy, you. you know, and um, we're just grateful for you, man. We love you a lot. And happy birthday. Right. Is yes. it is it this week or next week? Next Tuesday. On next Tuesday, Tuesday, you're celebrating 45 years of sobriety. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. Yeah. I mean, I got sober when I was 28 years old in LA, and there were hardly any treatment centers out there yeah. at all. And um, grace of God. Yeah. And so I can really honestly say from the time I got out of high school and college and the band and and working in the record business, working at Ice Capades, working at Cumberland Heights, and it, everything. Life has been grace. Mm. I've never done. I've never done anything I didn't want to do. Mm. Everything fell into place. Mm. Yeah. And so Cumberland Heights means a whole lot to me, and and um, so many stories out of here that and so uh, many people. Yeah. You yeah. know, just as I, in my limited knowledge having been here professionally for five years and learning more and more over time about um, our history and the the men and women who have been a part of our culture. I mean, there's there's generations, you know, arguably two generations of folks who have put their blood, sweat, and tears into the spirit of Cumberland Heights, what we call the atmosphere of recovery. And right. just want to do everything we can to make sure that we honor those folks, recognizing that all of us that are here today are just temporary proprietors. Yeah, you're, you know, you've for got the it next, right now. You know, for the next. <laughs> and that's, we're all, that's all we're worried about is just to make sure that we continue doing this work for for anybody that's affected by addiction. So let me ask you this. When you think about your time at Cumberland Heights from, uh, I think you said 1999 yeah. to... Uh, 2020. Mm-hmm, 20 years and some change. 24, 20, 24 years, I think. If that math doesn't work, then somewhere this eh, is fine. You know, you know somehow I mean? it's different. We'll go with 24 It's not years. 25, it's 24. Now Got how it. that works out, 2020 backwards. Got it. <laughs> how, um, how else did you see Cumberland Heights change? Well, in so many ways. Uh, it was a product of its industry, basically. It's the way we looked at things. And it was a male, mm. it was a male treatment center like, Pretty much all of them were back then, and, and uh, I think that uh, we had our brushes with trying to work public sector a little bit, mm-hmm. you know, as far as working with the state and things like that. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. But I think that uh, in going with outpatient, you know, and and trying to build a, you know, continuum. A continuum. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. Which that that's that was a big change in the industry. It was twenty eight days and fine. See you later. Mm-hmm. And that change into continuum of care was really important. Um, and I think the fact that we were a nonprofit made us. It made it in a way more challenging, but at the same time, it made us more unique. And we were a successful nonprofit. I mean, if you came to Cumberland Heights, you didn't know you were in a nonprofit mm. uh, facility. It looked every bit, and you felt like, and it was a for-profit type facility, mm. but it was nonprofit. Mm-hmm. And I think that it's something uh, we're proud of. Hmm? You know, it's something we're proud of. Yeah, and we continue exactly. to be proud of that we can to provide um, the highest level of service, either from our physical plants or our food or the number of staff we have or the furniture or yeah. the linens that, you know, we put every, every cent we can into these programs. The other thing is if you just going around meetings around town through the years and everything, mm. Cumberland Heights has such a big footprint in the recovery community in Nashville mm. because a lot of these people come from out all over the place and they stay here. They come in, they go to treatment, they go to sober living, and they stay here. And then you hear, and you're in meetings, and they hear, when I went to Cumberland Highs, when I went to Cumberland Highs, I came through Cumberland Highs, just constantly. So you know the kind of imprint you're making 
uh, just that alone would be a good barometer. Where do you hope we go? What do you hope we continue to do? I think I, if you can maintain what we have, which is the one, the big plant, and um, still retain the community of it, that's the most important thing. I mean, the most important thing to me, and you mentioned it in Stillwaters, the community. That's mm-hmm. the thing that always has to be achieved. And it's not the easiest thing to do. Sometimes we're good at it. Sometimes we're not as good. But that's what we need to strive for. The people come out of here feeling they know everybody that they came through with, that they love the time they're here, and they're willing to go back here and do anything they can for you. Mm-hmm. You know, Because people don't walk out of here just feeling like they're well. They feel like their lives have been changed. And that's a difference. That's a good point, actually. It, it's, they don't walk out of here feeling well. They feel like their lives have changed. I mean, it's... Yeah. it's and I hope they feel... Um, motivated to get to work, you know, motivated to keep pushing, yeah. motivated to keep changing. Uh, the community piece reminds me of yesterday we had, we were just talking about this, but Jamie Johnson from the Graskels. Yeah, yeah. And one of the stories he told, which just an incredible guy, so humble, um, just... Sweet guy. Yeah, yeah, sweet guy. Very talented too and very successful. But uh, like so many folks that have come through any mo- number of our programs, he wanted to talk about Johnny Rosen and yeah. the impact Johnny Rosen had on him one day when something was happening in his life um, and that it mattered. And then after the show, Johnny was actually here, as he always is, yeah, and they had yeah. a little reunion. But it just reminds me of the specialness of the, of the community, you yeah. know, that, that, that hopefully that everybody that comes through here feels like they matter. You yeah, know, they matter as part of our community, and that they feel known. If they can, that's see, what I was. If you can feel like you can make, I don't. For me, my sponsor has a, two years more than me. He's still in Los Angeles, and he's got forty-seven years, whatever. And he touched me when I was twenty-eight years old. He made me feel important when I didn't feel important. He made me feel cared for when I didn't. And so that man is still in my life, and he carried the message. And that's what we do, is we carry the message. Hmm. And it can change lives. One person can change a life. And we have all these opportunities when we have these people on campus to change their lives. Why do you think people... um, What is it about treatment? Don't even you don't have to think about Cumberland Heights necessarily, but what is it about treatment that helps people? It gives them an impetus. It's changed, it takes them out of their milieu. I mean, it's the same thing it was when I went. The thing that it, the advantage of Cumberland Heights, what for me or my treatment was, it took me away from everything that was bad. Everything that touched me the day before I went into treatment was bad. Mm. All of a sudden, I went to a place I could feel maybe clean or begin to get clean. And I think that that the fact that you're away from everything that you ever were for a long, for whatever that extended period of time is, is really a major piece in why it works. And I think that, you know, over the years, we've decided maybe we could do it longer, and that can, up to a year now, I think, a lot. Um, and I think that that's the reason is that we're getting out of our who we were. It takes us away. It gives. I mean, all you have to do is sit in a meet in a in a group here and listen to them and go. I can't believe I feel this much better. And it's only three days. I've only been here three days, and it's because you're taking them away from everything that they hated, and was killing them. One of the interesting things that happened that I I was really scared when I came to treatment. Uh, you know, maybe that's not obvious for some, but. To yeah. you, it would be, you know, I was, yeah, I was yeah. definitely afraid. I and I don't even know really what I was afraid of. You know, I think just the assumption is that something will be taken away, i.e. my primary coping mechanism, and I'm going to have to deal yeah. with that. And um, what I didn't expect is how the power of identification changed, changed my life. Like just being in a place where it was okay to be fucked up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't terminally hip or fatally cool anymore. Like I was right. just one of many. Yeah. 
Um, now, I, not to say that I can't feel different and separate and apart from and all those things, but but the value of hearing other people's stories and and connecting at a deep soulful level was really the that's the difference in AA and what there wasn't before AA. Yeah, this one yeah. alcoholic talking to another alcoholic, and I don't feel like you're trying to talk down to me. Yeah, exactly. You're not trying to diagnose me. You're just talking to me and telling me what happened to you. Right. It's a beautiful. It's the beauty of, of it. That's something that I think sometimes folks that if you don't have experience with recovery and you're stru- your 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 son or your husband or your wife or your cousin or whoever, yeah, struggles with addiction is that. The process, the, the change is a process, you know, um, it's not an event. It doesn't take place overnight. And I think sometimes one of our struggles with different just is that when you come to treatment that you're going to be done, that you're going to have this discrete experience and then it's over. And the reality is we're inviting you to practice a lifestyle and in a lot of ways um, that never ends. You know, yeah. and it's a big mind shift. And there's there's always a moment for somebody when you stop running away from addiction and you start running towards recovery. We talk about that all the time. Mm-hmm. And I hope that some of that light gets sparked. Well, yeah. Here. I mean, it's the, that's really the spiritual awakening. So I want to ask you about this because you showed me a picture of somebody before the show and – this is your grandbaby. Oh, my grandchild. Yeah. Is this your first grandchild? Yes, it's our first. How old is he? California, we didn't get married when we were 16. <laughs> <laughs> right. We get married a lot later. Yeah. But anyway. So what's that been like for you in your life and your recovery? How is it two? Eight, his name is, well, his name is Brooks Ellis Quinn, and he goes by Beck, B-E-C-K. Okay. Named yeah. after the great... Pop musician, Scientologist. No, <laughs> he wasn't. But Connor's going to kill he was, you. He yeah. was named after a surfboard company, Becker Surfboards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How's but that how's been? That for you? been? It's yeah. been unbelievable, and I, you can't. I mean, unless you've gone through it, and you go through it, and you go, "Yeah, you're right." You Are know? you a babysitter on call now? Yes. No, we're not only on call. We're a certain time of the week. And Monday and Tuesday, my wife takes care of me. And I'd like to say I did too, but she would, if she heard this, she'd be all over me because she knows I remotely helped She'll come them. at us in the comments, yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But, um, yeah, we get Monday and Tuesday we spend time with him. He is just, he's 14 months now, and he's a, he's a terror. Yeah. What a blessing, you know. But, yeah, to come from... Not knowing whether I, I, you know, I came into the program not knowing anything about treatment, not knowing anything about AA. I was really the Irish Catholic. We lived in a, you know, all Italians and Irish, basically. We lived out by the harbor in Los Angeles, which is all fishermen, you know. So we ended up, um, um, were you born and raised in LA? Yeah. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, I was. I explained this to somebody else the other day. Yeah, I was born in Riverside, California. We moved to El Centro, which is on the Mexican border. It's an, I didn't realize we lived three minutes three minutes from the border back then, and then we moved back to Riverside, and then we moved when the smog came. We moved out to the beach. We lived out in uh, Palos Verdes, okay. San Pedro, uh, yeah. the harbor. Yeah, and uh, lived there until I was seventeen, and then I went away to college and. Went up to the Bay Area and uh, was in the Bay Area uh, all the way through my 20s because we started a band in college and ended up going professional and doing a deal with Columbia Records and and, uh, went through um, uh, till I was 28 and uh, then went back down to L.A., ended up in treatment then because I had been... my parents, we didn't know anybody in the Bay Area, and my parents unloaded me at college, and I was like the summer of love during this, the uh, Haight-Ashbury. So I was hitchhiking from Berkeley to San Francisco going back and forth and, and getting into a lot of trouble, of course. But um, Is that where addiction started for you in that time period? No, it would not, I don't know. You know what? All my, in all the years I was on the road and in the band, I think I drank every day pretty much. And used cocaine as much as I could and was given. Um, but I think it really didn't start until the band broke up mm. and I went into a depression. I started drink to drink. Mm. I couldn't drink enough to stop the pain. 
And that was really, it only took one year. 27, 28, I was, it was it. But I didn't know anything about what I was going into. I had no idea what treatment was. I know right. I, Raleigh Hills, they used to have these places where you, they'd make you, it was a uh, Pavlovian. They'd make you throw up. They did, they'd have you drink and then they'd give you something to throw up. This is the program you went to? Huh? This no, the, I didn't. Oh, but that was, oh, I was like, that was the only one. That was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, there were, in L.A. back then, all you had was a Navy program, which you couldn't go through because it was only for people in Navy, and that was really advanced. And then we, uh, they had a thing uh, that was a cult that a guy in AA started for years whose name escapes me, all of a sudden, not Scientology. But anyway, um, and then these Pavlovian places, Raleigh Hills and different ones, so I kind of walked in and didn't know, even know what I was getting into. I didn't really know anybody sober. Most of all my friends are drunks. There were still Irish guys drinking or Italian guys drinking. So and this is the same. So you're 28 years old. You sobered up them. You met your sponsor then. Mm -hmm. And you've been clean and sober ever and since. And he hasn't been my sponsor the whole time. I've run out of I've I've killed three of them already. Gotcha. So he's now my last ditch effort. And he's healthier than me. So I'm hoping right. He right. Makes. But you've been clean and sober since then. Yes. Since you were 28 years old. 70. Just turned 74. Yeah. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. It's a big deal. It's a panorama it's a huge... to me. Yeah. You know, all good. Yeah, it's so interesting because it's not a lot of people's experience, you know, getting introduced to recovery and just staying sober. Yeah, it was really due to the fact that I had a major spiritual miracle. Dropped down on my knees, Bill Wilson, the wind, the scales falling from my eyes, moment. It was a moment in treatment, about 20 days into treatment. Mm. And before that, if you looked at my charts, they would have said, doing everything wrong, you know, everything. And I just went into a group, and they, uh, this is back in confront of therapy. This is where you'd get thrown in jail for doing what they did. But it worked for me. And um, at one moment, I, I just went down on my knees and everything, all the pain from the time I was 13 on just kind of washed away hmm. and at that moment my obsession to to drink went away hmm. and that it's was a miracle yeah it was yeah and it, it isn't the kind of thing that you want to sustain yourself on but it's the thing that mm -hmm. puts you into the into the everything and it never goes away but at the same time you still have to have growth and you still have to go to meetings all the time you still have to build and go through the steps and do everything we do in the uh, program and uh but I feel like I was very blessed to have that kind of grace type mo moment in treatment at the very beginning. Yeah. Well, Walt, I love you, man. <laughs> love I you really do, time. you know. And I, um, it's an honor. We're so glad that you came today. We're going to make you open that present. We're not going to do it on camera. Oh. <laughs> we wrote you a card and everything. And, um, Thanks for coming out. And you know this. I don't have to, have to tell you, but you're always welcome, you know. Well, thank you. Any day of the week. We would I love to have you. We need to have you. You know, you're still a part of our community, and yeah. we want to make sure that you're as involved as you want to be. I don't want to twist thank your arm, you. but I will, you know. Yeah. But it really matters, man. And, well, and, thanks for the opportunity to be able yeah. to even speak about things. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. And next time, I want to invite Connor out. We need to have him out. He's been um, doing great work in his own right with Brentwood Springs Detox and yes. just a pillar. Really, I, just, I, I will say this because I really believe this. They, they and he have built an amazing program that's increased access in Middle Tennessee for people to take that first step. Right. And, they, and, and uh, has been a great partner for Cumberland Heights. Well, thank it matters. You for saying that. It and I know he works too. hard at it. You know, yeah, he really cares. Him, yeah, deeply. You know, a lot of respect for him. Yeah. He's got 11 years, 10 years. So I don't mind saying that too. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Until okay. next time. Thank you, Walt.